there, guys. Welcome. It is so good to have you guys <laughs> with us for this Sunday's Digital Campus for Grace Family Church. Welcome, welcome, wherever you're joining in or whenever you get to watch this. It's so awesome that you could host us in your home, mm -hmm. in the car. Hopefully, you're not driving while you're watching this. In your hearts. Or wherever you are, in your hearts, mm -hmm. in the kitchen if you're making breakfast <laughs> or lunch. Oh, that's actually so, a good one. Why don't you welcome. let us know if you are making breakfast yes. or if you're eating breakfast? Why don't you get our, our taste buds salivating? Let us know what you're eating. And tell us what you're having. Mm. Uh, it better not be cereal. If it is, it should be Cocoa Pops. Um, yes, Cocoa Pops are the best. Uh, or, or maybe something nice and healthy. Captain Crunch. <laughs> Captain if Crunch. If you're from America, Captain Crunch, yeah, definitely. <laughs> KG, since you were last with us, something has changed. Yes, I am now 30 years old. Yo! Woo! Mm. Remember when we had our birthday celebration, I just say, if you want to if you want to know what 30 looks like, 30 looks like me, and I'm legit 30. So that's what it looks like. I feel like you've matured um, since we've seen you last on Digital Campus. I'm getting there. Yeah, it's good, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so we are really excited. Uh, we are in week two of our new series, Asking for a Friend. Um, and we have Tom with us today. Didn't Jay speak so well opening up the series? Oh, it is a really, really sure. challenging word. Very challenging. Uh, if you missed it, make sure that you catch up. Mm. But we're excited for Tom to speak to us this morning. We are or definitely. Or wherever you're watching this. Whenever you're watching this today. And Tom will be right up after this clip. Why do so many people frown upon people that are gay? I do have a lot, but right now... Why is life so tough sometimes and I have so severe ups and downs? Why is it so difficult for youths to get jobs in South Africa? Some people, they ask, when will this end? Is the world doomed? I think it's very important going into prayer and asking as to who the source and the image you've created the source is. How do you know that you've found your purpose in life? That's my question. So we're in a series called Asking for a Friend. And in this series, we're going to be looking at tough questions. Questions like, how can a good God allow suffering? Or what about, hasn't the church caused so much damage? That's the question that Jess, my wife, spoke about last week. If you missed the message, I really encourage you to go watch it. She did a fantastic job. Uh, in fact, such a fantastic job. Um, I've, I just want to say thank you to everyone who has uh, let me know that she is, in fact, the better preacher. So uh, that uh, I really appreciate that. <laughs> but um, uh, the, other, the question that we're going to look at today, the difficult question in asking for a friend is, how can I know the truth in a world of alternative facts or in a world of fake news? And I think this is such a relevant and a pertinent question for us today because, I mean, we are living in a post-truth world where it would seem that there are many claiming that there is no absolute truth or, or, or that there, you know, there's just so much fake news or what we call alternative facts. You know, it used to be that you're entitled to your own opinion, but now it would seem that you're entitled to your own facts. I mean, just watch Russian TV and then watch CNN. And it would seem right now that they each have their own truth, whether it's religion, Politics, gender identity, sexuality, moral ethics. It seems like everything is up in the air these days and the world has never been so polarized, so divided around some of these issues. So as a follower of Christ, I mean, how do we know the truth? Are there absolute truths that we can hold on to? That's the question that I want to look at today. So if you have a Bible, turn to John chapter 18. And in John 18, Jesus is standing trial before Pilate. Pilate was the Roman governor. And Pilate is sort of fed up with the whole situation. He, he can't find any fault in Jesus. He's irritated that the Jewish people have brought him to him. And he would have rather preferred that they just kind of handle this amongst themselves. And so he asks Jesus, he says, so are you king or are you not? And Jesus' response is so interesting. He says, you say I'm king. Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And then there's this kind of interesting response from Pilate. And I think Pilate, at this point in his life, I think he's a little bit cynical, a little bit jaded. I think he's kind of lost hope in the political and the legal structures of the day. Maybe you can relate. And so he responds with this. He responds with a question. He says, what is truth? What is truth? In the Latin, it's quid est veritas. And interestingly, uh, someone sent me this this week. Those Latin letters can be rearranged so as to read est ver qui adest, meaning it is the man who is before you. 
Now, that little Scrabble game aside, the question Pilate asks, I think, is a profound one. And many in our world are asking this question today. What is truth? You see, the complexity of our world has increased so much and so rapidly, it has many of us, myself included, spinning. And like I said, we're so polarized. On the one hand, you have those who are so dogmatic about the truth or what they see as truth, and you could say that they're fundamentalists. You know, this is how it is, and if you disagree with me, then, or, or you're, you know, if you're against us, then you're wrong, you're out, or at worst, you're our enemy. And I would argue that for those people, many of those people, they're, they're far too certain or at least more certain than they should be. On the other hand, you have many in our culture and our society that say there is no truth, that truth is what you make it, what you decide it. Own your truth, live your truth, be true to yourself. And, and, and if there is any sort of absolute, that absolute will be something along the lines of, you know, whatever makes you happy, as long as it's not hurting anyone else, right? And that can kind of sound reasonable to our modern ears at a surface level, but if you dig a little deeper, it's actually a lie. Now, as Christians, where do we fall in this continuum? Of course, I believe that the Bible does in fact declare some absolute truths. And the more we discover about science and how our world works, how our bodies work, I think we're discovering that there are also some definite absolutes there as well. And so there are in fact things we can know. There are things we can be certain of. But here's my point. Sometimes those things are not always the same things we thought they were. Or they're not always as certain as we would have hoped. I mean, have you ever been so certain of something that you're willing to like bet your life on it? And then years later, you're like, mm, I'm not so sure I believe that anymore. I mean, when I listen or look back on some of my first preachers, I'm like, ooh, that's definitely not theologically correct. <laughs> but at the time, I was absolutely convinced. And that's why I love Jesus, because so much of Jesus' ministry was showing the, the Pharisees, the religious guys of the day, of what, what they were convinced was, was right and true and absolute. Jesus was kind of like, hey, you know what, guys? You've kind of missed the point. It's actually not like that at all. What you thought was absolute, well, you were wrong. And Lord knows the church through history has been wrong. And then there are other times that Jesus says stuff that seems so definitive especially in our modern world, to our modern ears, so black and white. And we kind of thought, you know, that's just sort of optional extras or, you know, that's sort of up for grabs. And so all this comes back to how do we know the truth? What is truth? Now, I'm going to attempt to give you some answers or at least try my best to give you some ways of thinking that I think can help us to navigate this world of untruth and uncertainty. But before I do that, let me just back up a little and talk about the nature of truth and lies. Or should I say, the truth about lies. Uh, see what I did there? <laughs> see, this is really, really important. Uh, you see, I believe that we have an enemy. Call it the devil, call it evil, call it whatever. But I I'm not talking here about, you know, the dude with the red horns and the horn, you know, the tail and the pitchfork. It turns out that that image that we have of the devil is far more Disney inspired than it is biblically inspired. But I don't think many would disagree, Christian, non-Christian, that there is evil in our world, right? And here's my point. Uh, John Mark Comer writes about this so well in his book, uh, Live No Lies. And he says this, he says, I believe that our fight with this evil is first and foremost a fight to take back control of our minds from their captivity to lies and liberate them with the weapon of truth. In other words, the primary battleground for this war is ideas. And, and, th and this war, think it's less like these two massive armies coming together, very obvious, you know, good and bad side, think Lord of the Rings, but it's not really like that. This war is more like kind of underground. It's guerrilla warfare. I know Russia is in the news again, and, but, but what the Russians, they had this term that they used in the Cold War, and they called it disinformatia. That's where we get the idea, disinformation. And this was kind of an underground form of warfare, of propaganda and insurgency and spies and deception and raids on our mind on truth. There was a guy in the 4th century, a guy by the name of Evagrius, and uh, he was famous for allegedly going into the desert uh, to fight the devil like Jesus did. I mean, 
like you do, right? Uh, and anyway, he wrote this book um, about how to combat evil. And one of the most surprising features of Evagrius' sort of paradigm is thinking was his claim that the fight against evil is a fight against what he called logosmoi. And logosmoi is a Greek word that is translated as thoughts or thought patterns or your internal narratives, your internal belief structures. It's why the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, in Romans chapter 12, he says, Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, this is how you will know the truth. The message version puts it like this. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention. What is, it's again, it's, a, it's your thoughts on God. And what will happen? You'll be changed from the inside out. I love that. I think that's what Paul meant when he said, take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. It's what he meant when he said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil. Let me say it again. There is a war going on right now in our world and in your head. And it's a war between truth and lies. In John Mark Homer's book, his basic premise is, is really interesting. He says it like this. He says the primary, the enemy's primary tactic is to tell us lives, what he calls deceptive ideas that play to our disordered desires, which eventually become normalized in a sinful society. And I mean, we could do a whole series on this. Maybe one day we will. But let me give you kind of a very simple example of how this may play out. Maybe a silly example. But how many of you remember blank CDs? <laughs> do you remember blank CDs, blank DVDs? And what did we do? Or what did I do with blank CDs? Let me just be honest here. I ripped music onto them. I, I made up little mixed tapes and I would, you know, download music and put it on. And, and, and I know some of you did it. Don't just, I know you looked at me, uh, oh, how can the pastor do that? Um, and then how many of you remember those stir cynical ads about, you know, stealing movies or music? You know, it was like, you wouldn't steal a car, you know. And there was a video of a guy like putting a DVD under his jacket in this DVD store. And remember those. <laughs> um, anyway, th those uh, kind of stuck in my head. And I remember at a point feeling convicted that, you know, maybe I shouldn't be ripping CDs that actually this was stealing and I should rather save up and buy them from, you know, Musica. <laughs> and, and some of you have no idea what that story is. But anyway, here's what I'm getting to. When I started doing that, whenever I would sort of say to my friends, oh no, I don't burn CDs or I wouldn't accept an offer of a free CD from them, it would instantly spark like anger, in, you know, indignation. They'd get cross with me. Like, like, who are you to judge me? You know, you're so like self-righteous. Because what had happened was very quickly the, the moral ecosystem had shifted amongst my, my peers and even in the world. And now judging your friends for burning CDs was seen as wrong. But stealing was kind of seen as okay. And so right and wrong had been very quickly redefined along the lines of popular opinion. And the moral line moved in, and that happened in a few short years. And that may be kind of a silly or a small example, but this happens on a much larger scale and with far more important issues. Deceptive ideas playing to our disordered desires, which eventually become normalized in, in society. And so, <clears throat> what are we supposed to do about it? Well, as followers of Christ, this is where Jesus comes in. One of Jesus' most famous teachings is in John chapter 8. Uh, if you have a Bible, you can go, the words will be here. But he says this, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And in the context, Jesus had just told his followers that if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And as a result, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And again, the Pharisees, the religious leaders of the day, they just got so upset with Jesus for saying this. They, they responded, we are Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves of anyone is kind of ironic if you consider the history of the Hebrew people, but Jesus kind of explained to them that he's not referring to socioeconomic slavery so much as spiritual slavery because he responds, he says, for everyone who sins is a slave to sin, to those disordered desires. And, and that just made the Pharisees even more angry. And they proceeded to kind of make these snide comments about, oh, we're not illegitimate children. The only father we have is God himself, which was a not so subtle dig at Jesus's sort of parentage. 
In fact, in the original Greek, that's probably better translated as we're not bastards like you. To which Jesus responded with a fascinating claim about who their father actually was. He says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Now, <laughs> I know this idea of the devil maybe a, a lot, and I don't have time to do kind of a full exploration of this devil that, that Jesus speaks of, and I would hate for you to get sidetracked on this idea, you know, if, if it's hard to wrap your head around. But, but let me just say this. Every time a word that we have translated in English as devil appears in the scripture, it's not actually a name, it's a description. The accuser, the slanderer, the snake, the deceiver, the dragon, all this stuff. It's like imagery. But some, some scholars argue that that's kind of a dig from Jesus, like a deliberate snub that even his rival doesn't get a name. Um, others read it as a sign of how dangerous he finds this force of evil. Um, it's sort of like, you know, the equivalent of, you know, Voldemort, he who must not be named. Um, but for Jesus, the enemy is not a fictional villain from a Harry Potter novel. He is real and, uh, and a cunning source of evil. And the point is his primary method, according to Jesus, his go-to signature move, his native language is deception. It's lies. Uh, I, hope, I know there's a lot, but I hope you're still tracking with me uh, wherever you might be watching this from. But final point on truth and lies, then we're going to get practical. But when Pilate asks that question, what is truth? I think that's, it's important that we define what truth is. And, and the best definition I know of truth, again, from John Marcoma's book, he says it's reality. Or, or that which corresponds to reality. In other words, truth is what we can rely on as real. The chair you're sitting on, if you're sitting on a chair, is reality. The air I'm breathing now is reality. Jesus is reality. And the best definition of reality is what you run into when you're wrong. <laughs> you know, if you say, I believe I can fly, you know, I believe I can fly, um, and, and you walk off the top of a 10-story building, the reality is what you hit a few seconds later. So truth is reality because it's, there's a thing called gravity. And so therefore, if truth is reality, therefore lies are unreality. And that may seem pretty obvious, but I want to go a little deeper because we have these things, what psychologists call mental maps of how we define reality. These are like reference points in our minds by which we navigate the world. Neurobiologists talk about neural pathways, how we wire our brains. Sociologists talk about a worldview. Followers of Jesus might speak of their faith. It's all different terminology, but it speaks of the same idea. And our mental maps are made up of a collection of ideas, ideas that we've picked up from others, from our culture, from growing up. And these ideas all combine to form this map of how we navigate reality. It's like Google Maps, you know, or the GPS in your car. And, and in the same way that we have these mental maps of how we're going to get to work or school or our favorite coffee shop, we have these mental maps of how we see life works. Maps of money, maps about how we think sexuality works, how we think relationships work. Um, and, but here's the problem. The problem is if our mental maps are not true, if they're wrong, if we have the entirely wrong map, or if they're incorrect, if they don't correspond to reality, then just like in your car, we end up lost, sometimes very, very lost. It's like if the map says there's a road to the right and you get there, and there's no road there. That's, we're bumping into reality. The map's not right. And it doesn't matter how well you try and navigate your car, you, if the map's wrong, you're going to get into trouble. Let me say it another way. When we believe lies, ideas that are not congruent with the reality of God's wise and loving design, and then we, we open our minds and our bodies tragically to those lies and we let them into our, our muscle memory, then what happens is we allow an ideological cancer to infect our souls. We live at odds with reality around us and as a result we struggle to thrive because reality does not adjust itself to our illusions no matter how hard we try. The road will not just appear because it says so on the map. And so here's some kind of tough questions to consider. Whose mental maps do you navigate reality by? Whose ideas do you trust? Are you currently believing any lies? Maybe lies about how the world works that you've inherited. Lies about your body or about sexuality. Lies about whether or not you are the object of God's love and affection. Maybe lies about your past or whether or not there's hope for your future. 
Let me say it another way. Whose map are you using to navigate this life? Jesus's or your own? So now that we've kind of said all of that, um, we can hopefully get to a little bit more practical stuff. And, and today with the time that we have left, I want to suggest three ways that we as followers of Christ can combat the lies and discover truth, that we can live, that we can know truth in a, in a post-truth world, in a world of alternative facts. And I've abbreviated the three ways into an acronym called AFL. AFL. My oldest son, Will, he loves Minecraft and I discovered an acronym that he uses. He says, I'm AFK. And I said, what does that mean? And apparently AFK stands for away from keyboard. <laughs> they, they type that in. Anyway, but that's not what AFL stands for. AFL stands for abide, follow, love. Abide, follow, love. And I'd love to unpack those with you today. And so let's start with abide. Uh, remember Jesus' words. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Abide is not really a word we use these days, but it means to remain. It means to sit in it. It means to steep yourself in it. it, it you know, he talks about abiding in the vine, like, a, like a, a grapevine. So this is so many of us, I think we're so easily tossed by alternative facts, by fake news, by wind and storms, because I think we aren't anchored in God's word, in his truth. We don't know it. Or it hasn't become part of us. We, we can't see the overarching story. And, and let me just add a caveat here. I'm not talking here about biblical literalism or fundamentalism. I mean, I've heard it said so many times. I'm sure you have as well. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. You know, so simple, isn't it? Man, I think that's not true. <laughs> I understand the sentiment of simply wanting to live out God's word point blank, but that statement isn't true because if it was, well then, you know, you'd be wearing head coverings now watching church and men, you wouldn't have your long hair. You know, Paul says that's an atrocity and these are pretty clear instructions from Paul in the New Testament. And then you say, oh, but that's contextual and I agree 100%, but then how do we decide or who decides what's contextual and what's literal? The point is, it's just not as simple as that. You know, it's not as simple as God said it, I believe it. That settles it. I wish it was, but that's why we have Christians who disagree on things because it, the Bible isn't always that clear. And that's why we have to abide. We have to stay with it. We have to keep asking questions, keep wrestling, keep discussing. Abiding is the opposite of cherry picking verses that suit our viewpoint or lifestyle or agenda or what we've heard on YouTube or what we've been told. Abiding is about it's about steeping ourselves in God's Word. It's about holding two opposing ideas together at the same time without tearing apart. It's understanding nuance. It's hearing other people's perspectives and showing respect, even if we disagree. It's about, being not, it's about not being unreasonably certain, but rather understanding that there are good, loving Christians you know, who think vaccines are bad, and there are good, loving Christians who think vaccines are fine. <laughs> And there are good, faithful Christians who believe, you know, homosexuality is a sin. And they have good, faithful Christians who do not. And they both have their verses and their theology to prove their point. Abiding is about staying in the room when you disagree. It's about choosing unity over agreement. And resisting the urge to think in overly kind of compartmentalized ways. Abiding, on the other hand, may also mean for you coming to terms with things that the Bible or Jesus says that really rub you up the wrong way or that don't fit with your worldview or your mental map of what you think God is like or life is like. Because there's going to be things in the Bible that kind of confront the way we think. But here's the thing. I'm absolutely convinced that if we're willing to abide in His Word and keep seeking, then we become disciples of Jesus and we will know the truth in ever-increasing measure and the truth will set us free. Abide, AFL, abide, follow. I hope you're still with me. John 8, again, Jesus is saying, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John 4, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, says Jesus. And so think about this. If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and I believe he is, if Jesus' maps of reality are in fact true, which I believe they are, then it stands to reason that following him 
will lead us to truth and to life. And so even if you don't understand, even if you're here today and you're wondering if this whole church thing is kind of real, Jesus is real, even if you're not convinced that the, there is absolute truth or that the Bible can be trusted, I want to say never mind all of that. Just keep following Jesus. Just keep pursuing the person of Jesus because I'm convinced He will lead you to truth because He is the way, the truth, and the life. And it will help you. It, he will help you to discern the lies in your life and in this world. So here's another question to consider today. Who are you following? I mean, we talk about these days social media, you know, how many followers do you have or who do you follow so-and-so? And because the reality is we're all following someone or something even if it's just ourselves. So who are you following? Where do you find your truth from? And ultimately, do you trust Jesus' map of reality? Because if we don't, and this is just my experience and my belief, that if we don't, then I believe we'll be lost in a sea of untruth. Abide, follow, love. I wanted to end on this because here's the, the, the truth, the ultimate reality is actually love. You know, we've been speaking about truth, knowing the truth, but what we sometimes forget in our modern day is that there are, there are many different ways of knowing. I speak about this with Skip on the podcast, and I encourage you to catch up on our podcast. It's a fascinating kind of conversation, but we can know something by fact, that they call that focal knowledge, like the fact of gravity. It's measurable, it's observable, we can prove it. But there are other ways of knowing too what some call meaning knowing or tacit knowledge. It's knowledge through experience. You see, I can give you a book to read about my wife, Jess. You know, and you can know everything about her, the day she was born, her blood type and all of that. But I know my wife. And no book you ever read about her could ever amount to my knowing. And yes, that knowing is harder to prove or to measure. I mean, how do you measure love? But we know it's true and we know it's real. For far too long, I think we've been taught that religious ideas like good, evil, and God can't be known. They can only be taken by faith. But for Jesus and the, the writers of Scripture, the, the, the Hebrew tradition, faith is based on a type of knowing. It's a kind of deep trust in God that's grounded in reality. But unfortunately, that's not how we've been taught to think. Just as an example, real quick, you know, sometimes a study will come out, you know, that proves the truth of something that the Bible says or Jesus said. Like I recently read a study about gratitude that basically proves Jesus' words, you know, it is more blessed to give than to receive. In other words, the study just proved that the gen more generous you are, the happier you are. And we think, oh, cool. Well, now we know it's true because it's proven in science. <laughs> and the assumption is that before we just believed, but now we know. But I want to argue that both are in fact a type of knowing. And what I'm saying is, well, I'm saying that love is the, actually the most true thing we know. One of my favorite movies of all time is uh, Interstellar by Christopher Nolan. And I love anything by Chris Nolan. And there's this line where the scientists are arguing about what you can trust. And one of the scientists, the astronaut, says this. She says, love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. Maybe we should trust that even if we can't understand it. You see, love is real. Maybe even more real than any of this. Einstein said time and space are illusions of consciousness, albeit persistent ones. And then he speaks of a bedrock of love, an unalterable love that exists in our universe. I call that God. And so as we seek to make our way in an uncertain world, as we seek to know the truth in the midst of lies, I want to encourage you to look for love. Love is the ultimate ethic, the ultimate truth. And the Bible says God is love, that our highest callings as followers of Christ is to, is to love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these, says Jesus. You see, the opposite of lies is actually not truth. The opposite of lies is truth in love. Because you can be right, but the way you're right is so wrong. I mean, can I hear a shout out from any married couples in the room? You know, I mean, someone want to ask me, do you want to be married or do you want to be right? <laughs> you may be true in what you say, but you're so untrue in how you say it. And so look for love. 
when you're battling to discern truth, when you're not sure who to trust or what to trust, look for love. Does this video or person or tweet or whatever stir up anger and hate and fear or is it loving? Is it generous towards others, especially others who are not like me? Or does it have me turning away from my neighbor, my brother, my sister? Love means knowing that we are all created by God as good in our core and we're, we make mistakes. And God does not punish us for our sins. He seeks to correct us for our mistakes. He loves us. And I think that everything we're talking about today, if we stand on that, that our function on this earth is to see that love in each other, to stand on that love, to invoke that love, everything changes. Our criminal justice system changes, our economic system changes, our personal relationships change, our treatment of this earth changes. And I'm not talking about some wishy-washy, hey man, just love, you know, just go. No, this kind of love is difficult. And it doesn't mean we, we, we don't, you know, we, it means sometimes saying no. Love sometimes says no. Love, love doesn't make you a doormat. It simply makes you someone who's capable of owning your yes and owning your no. Looking for love means knowing that who we are is good at our core. You know, I, I know people say, oh, we're sinners saved by grace. And I get that. But I think that's an incomplete statement because we are first and foremost made in the image of God. With wonder, fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, marred by sin, of course but being remade by His Spirit. And I think we've forgotten that. Because when I look at you and I base my perception of you only on your mistakes, on your error, on your sin, on your lovelessness, then I'm stuck within that realm of lovelessness. But if I'm willing to extend my perception beyond what my, my physical senses perceive, your error, your sin, to, to what I know to be true of you, of how God created you, and I remind both you and myself of what is true in you and in me, then, then something happens, a miracle happens, a situation repairs. And I think if we want to not just survive, but thrive in this world of post-truth and fake news, we're going to have to do that on a larger level. The hatred, the cynicism, the anger on both the left and the right, all it does is dispel and deflect the possibility for these kinds of miracles. And we can still disagree passionately, but we can do it with love and we can do it with respect and humility. And to me, as Marianne Williamson said, that is the portal through which we can walk to a more sustainable world, to the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Let me close by saying this. Sometimes it's easy, I think, to get overwhelmed by the world we find ourselves in so polarized, so confused, so divided, so uncertain. Fake news, war, fighting. And I think we can become like Pilate, that Roman governor. What is truth? We can lose our faith. We can lose our hope. But I have hope because I believe that love prevails, that the crucifixion was followed by the resurrection. That slavery in Egypt was followed by deliverance into the promised land. That the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. As Martin Luther King said, I believe in people. I know the world is messed up right now and there are many things that need to change and must change. But I do believe that love will prevail. Because I believe that it always has and it always will. Because God is love. And in the end, love wins. The opposite of lies is not truth, but truth in love. Let's pray. Father, there's so much more we could say, and this is such a huge topic. As every single one of us seek to navigate a world of untruth, a world of lies and deception, and it's so easy for us to get swayed. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us to abide to abide in your word, which is truth. That you would help us to follow you every single day, not just on Sundays or when we go to church, but every day that we would be followers of you, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to love, to look for love, to be instruments of your love, just as you have loved us, that we would love those around us. This is the greatest command you tell us. And so help us to do it, we pray in Jesus' name.
never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Thank you so much, Tom, uh, for the amazing, uh, really compelling word. Mm. And also thank you for the, uh, for the team for leading us in songs. Mm. As we get ready to and uh, prepare our hearts to be able to give, firstly, we'd like to say thank you so much for your generosity. It's really making a difference in our world. For sure. And uh, there, there will be giving details popping up right now on the screen. Um, if you if you like a hipster like myself, you like using Zeppa, there's a Zeppa code there, or there's our banking details right there. But as we prepare our hearts to give, there's something I'd love to share with you that I was reading this week in the Bible, and it is found in First Chronicles chapter 29. And just to give you a bit of context, is that David, it was David's heart's desire to be able to, to build a temple for God, but he couldn't do so. And therefore, it, was, it became his son, uh, King Solomon's responsibility ability to be able to build a temple for God and therefore David acknowledged that what Solomon had it was a great responsibility for him mm -hmm. and he needed more support in building God's temple therefore King David together with the leaders of Israel they gave their finances or their wealth in order to be able to rebuild but in the same scripture there's a powerful prayer that David prays and that's what I want to share with you and in verse 13, this is what David says. He says, Oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Mm. Everything we have has come from you and we give you only what you first gave us. Mm. And that's so powerful because, you know, one of the ways that we get to respond is that we give to God what he first gave us us in joining his mission in healing the world let's pray together father we just want to thank you that you love us and that you first gave us and that we get to give towards your mission in healing the world mm -hmm. we thank you that we could respond to you with the generosity and with what you've blessed us mm -hmm. to give back to you in jesus name we pray jesus name. Amen. amen 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 sure Thanks, Cage. What an inspiring um, way to talk about giving today. Um, really means a lot. Thank you so much. Um, something exciting that yes. has happened this weekend is we had our Alpha Weekend away. So um, in-person campuses went away to different venues yes. um, from Grace Family Church. And then we also had our digital Alpha evening together. Yeah. Um, we went away um, from <laughs> our homes, in our homes, maybe a different room. Um, so it was a lot of fun. Um, it was a time where people were filled with the Holy Spirit. We had yeah. baptisms. You swam in a pool. I swam. Mm. Swam. Impressive. Impressive. <laughs> 
Um, so we had a great um, time together and time of building community. If that sounds like a lot of fun and something you're interested in, check it out. In the second half of the year, we'll be running Alpha again, um, and we'd love to have you join us. Um, a great way that people can also get involved, yeah. um, besides being involved in courses, is by hosting. Yes. So uh, a host, basically, are the awesome people who you see on whatever platform you're watching on, who will post comments, and they'll put up all the giving details, um, any form links you may need, they're just basically helpers there on the day, facilitators, hosts, um, and we are always in need of new hosts. Um, things come up in people's lives and you're just able to volunteer for a season. So if you are interested in helping this way on a Sunday, um, we would love to have you involved. Just fill out the form um, from the link that our hosts will pop, in pop into the pop. Yeah. pop into the comment <laughs> section um, and we'd love to have you guys involved. Okay. Um, one of the ways that you can continue to, uh, to to stay in touch with us because we would like to join with you throughout the week mm. is that on Tuesday we have our podcast and this is where we get to continue or to explore more in depth about the topic that we're speaking about. Mm. Make sure that you listen, make sure that you share with your world, listen while you're driving. That's the one thing yeah. I like about podcasts is that you can drive and you can still listen to them. Exactly. Uh, don't watch them, On the go. listen to them. Yes, on, yes, yes. on the go. <laughs> Drive safely, arrive alive. Yes, exactly. <laughs> then Super. on Thursday, we've got a 10 with Tom, and 10 with Tom is exploring faith 10 minutes at a time. It's That's just, right. you know, just short time just to listen and something there to, but you can actually do it as a daily devotion. Yeah, it'd you be know? cool. Hey? Because it gets you thinking, it gets you expounding more on the topic mm. as we hear what. Uh, Tom has in his heart mm. that will definitely change our lives. It's exciting yeah. stuff. Um, if you would like to be notified about these, um, the great way to do that is yeah. to subscribe, to like our pages yes. on whatever platform you're on. Um, if you are on YouTube, you can click on the little bell Bing. notification. <laughs> That will then notify you when yeah. we go live for the podcast, 10 with Tom, Sunday services, um, and it just helps us know who we are reaching and where in the world. It's a great way for us to know who is out there and um, involved in our community. Yeah, boo. Yeah, definitely. So it has been so great awesome to have you guys to with have us. You guys. Great to have you back with us, Thank KG. you so much. I love you guys at home. And you I, love me. And I feel the love. Uh, Kerry is something like that. I'm oh, joking. It's okay. <laughs> I love you guys too. So we, we will catch you next week Sunday. Otherwise, we'll see you on Tuesday or Thursday. Cheers, Cheers everyone. Bye.